What's going on guys, I'm your host Aaron Lloyd and this is episode 52 of The Creation Grounds. Before I get into our next fabulous inspirational guest, I want to encourage you, yes you, to like, share, subscribe, tell people about the podcast that you think will benefit from it, genuinely benefit from it, be inspired, motivated, educated, and all of that. My next Canadian born guest is Natalie Roy. This year, you have seen her in Bull as Olivia Wright on CBS. And if you have not seen her in that yet, check it out. But I know you have most definitely seen her in the viral match commercial at the end of 2020 in which she plays 2020. Directed by Ryan Reynolds and produced by Ryan Reynolds. In this episode, she's going to share with you some mindset tips. She describes her own experience where she was struggling with kind of depression and feeling like the bookings weren't coming in and how she made a breakthrough in her own mindset to basically get her to where she is today. She's going to give some books to you. She's going to give some self-taping tips for you. I know in this environment where we're in Zoom and kind of meeting people and we're not in the room and they can't really feel us and see us and sense us. She gives some, basically some tips on how you can shift that thinking for yourself. Um, She also coaches on audition. She's in a 2% collective. She has a podcast, which she also introduces into this episode. So if you have not already listened to that, make sure you go over there and check that out. And um, she just gives some valuable, valuable inspirational tips for actors who really are feeling like they're stuck or in doubt or insecurity. I know this episode is going to inspire you. It's going to uplift you. It's going to make you feel lighter in your spirit. Enjoy this episode with Natalie Roy. I'm very excited and thrilled to welcome my next guest, Natalie Roy, part of the 2% Collective. She has activated coaching as well. How are you doing, Natalie? I'm so good. I'm so happy to be here. Cool. Where were you born? Oh, what a great question. I was born in a little place called Keswick Ridge, New Brunswick, in Canada, on the East Coast. <laughs> the east Coast of Canada. Is that warm or cold? Very cold. <laughs> Very cold. Cool. So, so New York is nothing nothing for you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's manageable. <laughs> so tell me about the day that you discovered you kind of wanted a, a life in the arts and that you wanted to just perform for, for your life. I mean, my parents will always say that thing, which I'm sure many parents say, which is like, I was just always a drama queen. I love drama. I love to create drama. And so I think very early on, I was just very fascinated with all these things. But it was cool being a kid who grew up in a really, really small town. Like, there were 800 people in the town I grew up in. So um, I don't even think we're called a town. We're called a community because we were that small. But for some reason, I used to go outside and play. And when the other kids were playing, like, bicycles or trucks I was always singing making up plays making my friends like casting them in roles and telling them to do things and so I think it was just something innate in me that was creative there was this creative element in me it didn't always manifest necessarily as an actor sometimes I wanted to paint sometimes I wanted to draw sometimes I was singing dancing but there was this kind of motivating force in me that always wanted to make something that wasn't here yet as opposed to playing with toys that were already here right so I think that's where it started there was always this little sparkle in me and then I really you know as a kid growing up just watching tv at some point I just had this fantasy that I was going to move to New York and be an actor but I was like five and my parents were like how does she even know what New York is? How does she even know what acting is? Um, And it wasn't something I ever pursued really professionally. Um, Certainly where I grew up, it wasn't really that accessible. Like I played on the basketball team and I was in the play, but you know, we, we didn't have that much access to things necessarily. So it was great because there were so few kids in my school. I always got cast as the lead because there wasn't very many of us. And uh, I got lots of chances to just play. And then when I went to high school, I got involved in musical theater, which was so fun, but I have very little talent in musical theater, but I just found it the most fun thing that anyone could do. And uh, then when I went to college, I actually didn't go to college for theater, although I loved performing still, and I really had a desire to perform. I, I kind of chickened out of going to theater school, and I just wanted to stay home, and I ended up getting a degree in psychology, philosophy, like a BA, basically, uh, which all helps me a lot as an actor now who knew that all those wonderful psychology classes would come in so handy. But then after the college experience and getting involved in the plays on campus and things like that, the the itch was really needing to be scratched. So at that point I moved to Toronto and said, 
I'm just going to do this professionally. I'm going to just see what this looks like. I'm going to try to get an agent and start going to auditions and just try my luck at this whole thing. And here you are. That's beautiful. You have some amazing things going on. 2020 was a year. You have some fascinating things going on in 2021 already. We'll come back to that. What was uh, What's the top three things on your Spotify list? What are you listening to nowadays? Oh, that's so good. Okay. Um, I started during 2020. I started being a runner for the first time ever in my life, uh, just basically because we were in a pandemic and there wasn't much to do. So I just started running around Central Park. So I discovered Spotify for the first time in 2020. And there's this amazing uh, playlist called Confidence Boost, but it's kind of all, um, it's kind of music that's like, uh, it's like throwback music that's done with like a pop and beat that you can run really fast to. So there's a combination of that. My other thing that I like to listen to all the time is the Hamilton soundtrack. I love it. I'm just obsessed. I'm totally obsessed. And again, that's like the the right... uh, kind of beat that you can really get a good workout if you're listening to that um and then otherwise i've been on this like indie folk journey recently <laughs> that i'm just like if i want to go and write in my journal i go into that world that's beautiful so we know you study psychology you're an expert at that you help coach actors in mindset um what was the shift for you when did that happen the first kind of breakthrough in your own mindset that shifted things for you Yeah, so as I said, I went to Toronto, and I really tried my hand at being an actor, and, uh, you know, I got a a waitressing job that I actually loved, and was working at a restaurant, and then going to auditions during the day. I did get an agent, which I felt very lucky for, because I didn't really have that much training at that point. What happened is, early in my career, I got a couple of big wins, so I was cast um, as a lead in a film, and I was cast in a TV program, like, within the first couple of years of being out auditioning and, and the bookings were coming pretty steadily at that point. That was really great. And so then, uh, fast forward to about four, four or five years, uh, being an actor professionally, I just hit a slump. I hit that moment that many of us hit where I just kind of couldn't get an audition. I couldn't get called in. The momentum I had seemed to go away and I got, very depressed. I got very heavy, very, what's wrong with me? Why is this happening to me? Uh, It's never going to happen. I'm never going to work again. What's the point? And I had a little bit of a a existential crisis, so to speak. And so at that point, I actually knew that I needed to shift my inner world because I was feeling like no matter how much energy and action I'm putting towards making things better, towards changing things, nothing was happening because on the inside my insecurity was so huge and my self-doubt was so huge that it was winter and it was Canada and I said you know I think the best thing for me to do right now would be to leave and so I just got on an airplane I, I went on Craigslist I found someone who said like yeah you can live in my second bedroom in Los Angeles for five months six months and I was like I'm gonna get on a plane I'm gonna quit my job and I'm gonna go move to Los Angeles for like five months. And my whole goal was to not be an actor. I didn't want to go to LA to be an actor. I wanted to go to LA to escape being an actor. I don't know why. I just thought I had this vision (laughs) of sitting on a beach and, uh, you know, riding a horse or something. I just had this vision of like getting away from everything and being in the sun and just spending time with myself. Mm -hmm. So at this point I had never really done any mindset work. Um, I ended up being really lost in LA. I, I really, (laughs) <laughs> the night I arrived in LA, I got my rental car and I was driving on the freeway sobbing because I was even scared to drive and I got pulled over for driving too slow on wow. the freeway. <laughs> that is just, new. It was a mess. <laughs> it was a mess. And uh, I'm staying in this person's apartment and I have, I feel like I have no purpose in life. I gave up acting. I don't know what I'm doing. And I stumbled into this little yoga studio and I'd never done yoga before. I ended up laying on the mat. I couldn't do any poses because I was just crying. I was so lost. And I left the class and I said to the teacher, I don't, I don't know what I just did there. I just laid on a mat and cried for an hour. And she said, yeah, that's yoga. She's like, good for you. You did it. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And she's like, well, you, you joined yourself. You were with yourself and you felt your feelings. Like that yoga is about union. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's to yoke. And, and I was like, well, what is this practice? I, be, I Maybe this is what I need. So this same teacher said, I had a sign on the door that said she was doing a teacher training to become a yoga teacher. And I signed up. Wow. I, I'd never done yoga before. I was like, whatever she's doing, I just feel like that's what I need. <laughs> and so 
I ended up staying in LA for a, a year and I became a yoga teacher. I became, I, I learned and studied deeply meditation therapy. I'd never meditated before to this day. I'm a horrible meditator, but it's a practice. And I just, and somehow showing up for these processes was doing this really changing work inside of myself. And I started reading books on mindset and spirituality and growth and uh, positive psychology. And as I was doing all of this, completely separate from being an actor, one morning I just woke up and it was like, what if actors knew this stuff? Like, what if we took these tools and not just for how to, how to live a more peaceful life, what if we took these tools into an audition room? What if I took these tools into handling rejection? What if I took these tools into being on set? Oh my gosh, it's like untapped territory. And there's so many artists who I assume are having the same struggles as I am who feel so alone. And what if we could bring these mindset tools to actors? So that was when I left LA. I went back to Toronto and I immediately started uh, working at a studio where I just started doing meditation class for artists and um, visualization classes for creatives. And I just started this little ball rolling and then Years later, when I was able to move to New York and get my green card and now become a citizen of the U.S., I just kept on teaching these tools, and my, my acting career came back, and it came back stronger than ever, and my bookings got bigger, and I, I really so intuitively felt like it was because of the internal work that I was doing that I really made a commitment that as long as I can be an actor, I will also make sure I give these tools to other actors. I love that. It's it's such a powerful testimony of like how our inside worlds reflect our outside worlds. So I, I think that's a, a powerful testimony. Um, what you, you also what what advice do you have for for actors who experience doubt about themselves or or career career consistency and how they can turn it around? I think they can draw a lot from what you just expressed. But if the, if you have any other tips. Yeah, I think that the first thing I would say is having doubt as an artist is part of being an artist. And so I think there's sometimes something in our psychology that I think if I have doubt, it means I'm doing it wrong. But you're a creative being and, and your instrument is always changing and you're just getting to know it moment by moment. And you're going to an audition and you're expressing your human heart and you're being vulnerable and exposed. And so of course it makes sense that I'm going to have doubt about that every time I show up to that process. I don't have doubt about making my bed. I don't have doubt about, you know, paying a bill <laughs> because that, that doesn't mean anything to my human heart. Right. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to be a brave enough person to put my heart on the line and vulnerably open myself up in that way, then I think, yeah, we're going to have doubt. And I actually, Pam Grout is one of my favorite authors and she has this cool book called art soul reloaded. And I pulled this, uh, for you because she says working artists have never conquered their shaking knees. Sir Lawrence Olivier suffered tremendous stage fright. John Steinbeck also felt like an imposter. George Orwell endured an entire lifetime of unpopularity and insecurity. And it's like the only difference between the artists who do and the artists who don't is like we can take doubt by the hand and go, yeah, it's all part of the gig. And it doesn't mean that I'm not meant to do this just because I have doubt. And maybe the doubt can actually be a healthy resource to keep me humble, to keep me really understanding how much I love this. And to know that consistency in my work has always shown up for me when I have said doubt, insecurity, I'm just going to bring them right along. I'm going to nurture those parts of myself. I'm going to know that every character I play also has deep insecurity also has things they're afraid of. And so when I bring that wholeness of myself to whatever I'm doing, I tend to create an environment where there's nothing to fix before I can be an actor. And when I'm in that game, the work can really flow more consistently. I love that. Um, just surrender to it. I, I love that. Um, you help actors with self-tape as well. So this is one of your fortes. You're kind of an expert at it. What what can what's a practical tip for listeners to do besides taking your class that that can like help help them immediately implement? Like if they're listening for a tip. To That's improve. a great question. Yeah. Well, you know, we all miss being in the room, obviously. And I hear a lot of actors say, I'm just worried about self taping because I know when you're in the room with me, you're going to feel my energy and you're going to get who I am. I don't know how to translate that energy onto a tape. And I actually think that's a bit of a limiting belief because, you know, when you and I are sitting at home watching TV, 
we're watching actors on a television screen who are not in the same room with us and we feel their energy. We feel their process. We feel their stakes. We feel their opinions. So part of training like a pro is saying how I show up on my self tape is exactly the same as you being in the room with me. And there is like a technique to that. There's a technique of being uh, open, willing, able to bring your whole self. So the first thing I would say is know that you on tape are as powerful and as compelling as you are in a room. That's what it is to be an actor, you know, and, and we have this gift. And the deeper the specificity, the deeper the personalization you can find in the work that you're doing, the more people through that screen will feel your energy and they will feel it exactly as if you're in the room with them. So the first thing you want to do when you start looking at how can I really master my self tapes is you first want to get rid of any limits that your self tape is going to be a lukewarm version of your performance that you could do in the room. And as soon as you get rid of that thought, then you can just really, really focus on how can I adequately tell this story? How can I show up in service to this story, not in service to myself, in service to this story? And I always remember one of my acting teachers uh, in, in Toronto, uh, he, had, he had talked to me about, he, he owns the Rotenberg studio, David Rotenberg, and he always talked about, you know, the gift it is to be an artist that some people wake up every day and they drive, you know, before the sun's even up, you know, an hour or two to a job that they're not in love with. And they sit at that cubicle under those fluorescent lights and they work all day and they're sitting at their computer and they're eating lunch at their computer and they're working, working, working. And then they take that same commute home and they get home and the sun is set again. And it's like they take off their jacket, they take off their shoes, they sit on the couch and they turn on the TV and that is like the best moment of their day that they get to come and they get to sit and they get to feel. And if you're the person on that screen, allowing them to have that moment, mm. then that is worth all the rejection, all the heartbreak, all the disappointment, all the insecurity, all the doubt that we work through in order to be an artist. Cause that is a big service to someone and a big service to more people than we even know that we're touching. So the more that you can make your tape about who am I touching? What am I serving? As opposed to how good am I? How do I feel validated? Or how do I feel good about myself? The whole game starts to change. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Uh, what what book has impacted your life the most? You, you gave um, some quotes from one that you just really like. Is that the book that's impacted you the most, would you say? I would say, for me, there's, there's two books that really stick out in my mind. The first one is the very first spiritual book I ever read. It's called The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Michael Singer has, like, the coolest story. He was just this, like, normal dude who, uh, you know, started having these thoughts about what is the meaning of this and why do things work like this? So he wrote this incredible book called The Untethered Soul, which I highly recommend. And he followed it up with a second book called The Surrender Experiment. Now talk about like a guy who's just a total surrender, as you mentioned, that he, uh, he talks about in The Surrender Experiment how he would like walk by a store and see like this old piece of equipment and be like, I don't know why, but my heart feels kind of drawn to it. And then he'd <laughs> buy and then he'd buy it. And then all of a sudden he's a millionaire because he did something with this thing that no one else could figure like but he never did anything to get a result to make money. He even talks about buying this piece of land because he just wanted to meditate and be by himself and not be around anybody. And he he was sitting in his little trailer on this piece of land and all of a sudden like a woman comes and is like, Can I live on this land? And he's like, No, I did this to get away from people. <laughs> but he's like, But I made a commitment, I was gonna surrender. So I guess if she shows up, I'm gonna let her live here. And then he ends up marrying her. It's like wow. it's like an amazing, amazing story about what happens when you're more in a practice of of saying yes and surrendering to the circumstances as opposed to fighting against them and making stuff happen. So his books are really, really inspiring. And then if you're an actor, if you're an artist or creative in any way, I feel like our Bible needs to be Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. She talks so much about, you know, our relationship with fear and creativity and our relationship with results as opposed to like the craft and being in service to a vocation. And I think it's all really good things to keep in mind because it's so easy as artists to get lost in I'm only as good as my next booking or I'm only, you know, as good as how many credits I have on my resume or, you know, what good feedback I get in a room. And, and there's really, for me and both of these authors, this really deep commitment to saying, 
no, this is a gift. Like I get to be an artist. I get to be in relationship with this talent. This talent could have been in anyone. Like the talent I have in my body could have been given to you, could have been given to Beyonce, could have been given to Oprah, could have been given to anyone. And it was given to me. And so how can I just show up every day and be like, I'm so excited to see how I can use this today and how I can get to know this part of myself better. That's wonderful. How did, uh, the match commercial come into your life? How did you draw that into your life? And t- what's that oh, experience? That was so fun. So one thing that I always uh, like to talk about, especially in my um, my acting class that I teach, I teach, teach a four week kind of master class on mastering the self tape, and we do a little section on commercial auditioning. And I always say in commercial auditioning, always remember that the product is the star and always keep like going back to like what this product is. So there was this audition for match.com and you know, just like a normal audition, it's on zoom and you know, there's some, uh, <laughs> it was the director who was uh, zooming with me at the audition and he's like outside in his yard. Like it was very casual. It just didn't necessarily seem like you're talking, you talking about Reynolds. You're talking about Ryan. Uh, I, Ryan Reynolds was the writer of the script which I found out later, and he also was producing it. And so uh, he has a company, Escape Velocity Content, and uh, they do like some incredible stuff. So this is his kind of DP director that he works with, and he was like sitting in his backyard, and we're doing a Zoom meeting. Now, the breakdown said, you know, this woman is really wretched. She's I'm basically playing <laughs> year 2020, and it was like, you know, she's selfish and entitled and out of touch and... And this was during the time when uh, the language of, like, the Karen was, like, really present. Oh, right? man. Like, this was starting to be something in the zeitgeist that we were all saying. Like, oh, what a Karen, what a Karen. And so even in the character breakdown, they were describing her this way. And I had this intuition. I was like, oh, I think, I feel like a lot of actresses are going to go in and they're going to play kind of a tragic, awful woman. But the product is Match.com. The product is about people falling in love. So I went into the audition dressed like I was a crazy person, but playing like I'm a girl who's in love. I don't care what the, the circumstances is that I'm 2020 and I'm falling in love with the devil. Like the circumstances by themselves are funny, but my job as the actor is to sell the product, which is anyone can find love, even crazy, horrible people. So I think that that was what gave me the freedom and permission to, you know, I mean, we'd almost, we'd have to ask the people who cast me, why I got the role, but I felt like intuitively in my body, that was the, the thing that I felt like I brought that, that maybe other people had missed or, or that just felt really authentic to me. So, you know, then we went through the callback situation and I remember at the callback, just feeling in the groove of it all. Like we were all laughing and having fun. The producers were there and, um, and then it was just a few hours later, I got the call and they said, yeah, they, they want you to do it. And then, and then they said, and also uh, Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively want to know if you'll dye your hair blonde. And I'm like, let's do it. So <laughs> it just became this really crazy, fun thing. Being on set was so fun. And it was my first time on set in, in COVID set regulation world. And um, it, just, it was just a really magical experience. I was just present. I was having fun. I couldn't believe how I got to do this. I mean, there was one scene we did where we were in MetLife Stadium, just the devil and I having a picnic, and the whole stadium is empty, and it's freezing, and it's cold, and it's raining. And I looked at this other actor I was with, who's the world's tallest bodybuilder. Is he really? <laughs> like, he's a, he really is. And I looked at him, and I said, when are, when are two human beings ever going to get this moment again? Like, this is the magic of being an actor. Like, look at this moment we get to be in. And we were both almost crying. It just felt so fun and exciting. And then, you know, when we wrapped it, it was just the feeling of that was so much fun. What a great chance to get to play. And whoever knew it would end up going viral within five hours. And then we would film a second one, which also went viral. And I think the last time... Last time I got any numbers and then we stopped counting was we were at 4 billion impressions. 4 billion with a B. Yeah. That is incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Really cool. That's what, uh, that might have been your favorite moment on set, MetLife, that you uh, just explained. But do you have any others or was that your favorite moment? There was also a really great moment where we, we were filming in a gym. And, of course, um, 
Aaron Reed, who plays uh, the devil in the commercial, he is a professional bodybuilder. I mean, his his arm is kind of as big as my whole body. <laughs> and uh, there was one section where they let us improv a lot. They let us, you know, say what we thought would be fun to do. And so there was one moment where he's like, well, I should just bench press her. And I was like, wait, you can do that? And then the next thing I know, I'm like in the air and he's like pumping me above his body. And I'm just like laughing, like what is happening? And then there's all these people at the gym like, what is happening? Why are these people doing these crazy things? Um, so there was just like moments like that on set. And, and I do know that one of one moment I'll never forget is the whole time we were filming, and I always say this to actors, you never want to live into the fantasy that there's ever some place you're going to get and that everything's going to be perfect. Because even when you're doing this job that you love, everything's always going wrong. Someone on set's unhappy. Like things take forever. You're losing your light. Like there's always, it's always a big chaos being on set, but that's part of the fun. And so we were outside. We were supposed to film the, the scene where him and I meet each other and we're going for a walk in the park, but it is pouring rain it is freezing cold we all have hand warmers all over ourselves we're just we're freezing and it's it's the moment where we're meeting for the first time there's like thunder and lightning but then we were laughing we're like well of course 2020 and the devil would think it was fun to be out on a date during this crazy weather day and it, it was kind of hilarious and and then i was doing the line where i say hey i'm 2020 or something like that and um, all of a sudden one of the producers walks over to me with a phone and they said, oh, it's Ryan for you. And I was like, oh. And he's like, hey, can you try the line like this way? Da, 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 da. And I, I was like trying to be cool. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, <laughs> is, anyone, is anyone seeing what's happening? This is like the coolest thing. Um, so there are moments like that that kept happening that just felt like a reminder to me that, yes, being an actor is it's a business. And we are entrepreneurs. And we take care of our business and we we treat things very um professionally but I always in those moments am reminded that just because I treat it professionally doesn't mean I have to take it or myself seriously because at the end of the day we're five-year-old kids running around doing cool stuff and it was a really fun moment for me to remember that it's magic that's what we do it for the magic you know we don't we don't do it even to end up with millions of dollars in our bank accounts although that would be a wonderful you know, side product, but it's really about, can I remember the magic of what it feels like to be a master creator who's, who's masterfully creating with other masters? Like that's the joy of it. And did you learn anything from your co your co-stars while you're on set? I would say the really interesting thing that I learned was really what a truly great collaboration can look like because on in with that, that universe and these are, um, you know, Ryan has assembled a really incredible artist and they, they do several things together. You know, like after we were finished shooting match, they were going off to shoot um, another commercial for like a Christmas spot. Like they, they all kind of travel together and they work really well together. But there was something beautiful in the trust that they gave us to say, hey, what do you guys want to do? Hey, do you guys want to say a line here? Do you want to, you know, they, they gave us freedom to even, you know, play and they gave us trust in our talent that they cast us for a reason and so they would give us you know some freedom and liberties and then the producers trusted the costume people and the costume people trusted the sound people and everyone just worked together saying hey we're a bunch of people who know what we're doing who can come forth and so there wasn't this big sense of any one person having to be in control or micromanage everyone else and I really think the best thing I learned is that in that way of working where everyone is a master and every single person is part of the solution or part of the grand answer that we're all trying to create if you really allow yourself to work in that way which requires trust it requires surrender and it requires you knowing that you are part of a machine and that you're an important part of the machine no matter how big or small your part everybody has a part to play i think when you work that way that's really when something bigger than just the project itself can come out of it. And I certainly felt like the success of this particular piece was really rooted in that. It was the ability to take a very, very difficult time, very um, heavy time. Many people had experienced one of the hardest years of their life. And there was something really powerful in bringing forth an ability to have some joy, to have some levity, to have some laughter, 
not lightening anything that anyone had experienced, but just saying like we as artists, like our job is to come forth and bring healing or bring levity or bring new perspective to things that feel really dark and hard for people. And if we all do that in community, then all of us feel lighter together. How, how can people enlist your coaching services, your self tape services and mindset services? Uh, thank you. Well, I do work as a mentor in the 2% collective with you. Yeah. Um, we have an amazing group over there and, uh, it's, you know, a, a lot of very dedicated, talented actors who are really like working, working their craft and working their mindset game and working all these things. So if you're interested in that, you can head over to the Facebook page, the, um, the green lounge on Facebook and uh, you can join that Facebook group and you can find out more about that program. Um, and you can also email me. You can just email me directly and I'll tell you what I've got cooking. Um, my next round of classes is actually going to be in April because the March class is sold out already. But if you want to hop in and do some, some fun, some playtime with me, I would so love that. And it's my name, Natalie Lynn, L Y N N Roy R O Y at gmail.com. You also have a podcast that just hit Spotify. Congrats to that. Yeah, uh, thank you. How can people listen to that? And what's the name of that? Thank you. The podcast is called Let's Play the Create Podcast. And create is the acronym C.R.E.A.T.E. Create Podcast. Um, and you can go to thecreateseries.com. And you can find out the podcast, the information. You can look it up on Spotify, on iTunes, on Simplecast. We have 187 episodes. They're all dedicated to artists, creatives, you know, living your purpose, living your dreams, the things that come up along the way. We just did one about being the overcomer of obstacles and how we can invoke a different kind of path. Um, we also sometimes have interviews with other great creatives and authors and things like that. So it's a really good place to get a little spiritual soul food if you're a creative. Beautiful. And I ask all my guests this. When you think of the word creative, who comes to mind for you and why? And I'm fascinated by what your answer is going to be. I feel like you're going to come with some heat. <laughs> oh, my God. No, no pressure. No pressure. But I'm, I'm so really curious. Good. You know, the first, the, first, um, the first thought I had was Rumi, of all things. Rumi nice. has this beautiful poem that says, uh, outside of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field, and I'll meet you there. And I always think that field is what is creative for me. The field outside of what I think I am, what I don't think I am. My insecurity, my narcissism, my um, the things I can't do, the things I know I can do. Outside of all that stuff, outside of anything anyone else tells me to be, anything I think I'm supposed to be, outside of that, there's like this little space, this little field where you just get to show up and go, what excites me? What do I want to do? What am I into? What am I interested in? Who do I want to do it with? There's something inside of that little field that I think is creative source. And I like to spend as much time as I can there. Natalie Roy, how can people connect with you? You got an Instagram, the Twitter, the social handles. Where can people find you? I do. I just figured out how to get on Clubhouse. I feel like such a millennial. <laughs> I need an iPhone. I got a Joy, but I'm, I'm stubborn. I'm not yes. switching. <laughs> Uh, all the combos um but on instagram which i'm on often it's miss m-i-s-s -S, natalie roy and you can also join the create facebook page it's called the create community facebook page again it's the acronym c.r.e.a.t.e community facebook page um and i'm on there every day and uh, again you can also email me natalie roy at gmail.com and you can go to my website, thecreateseries.com. We've got online classes. I've got free meditations. I've got uh, we've got a newsletter. I send out weekly newsletters every week. About right now, I'm doing a whole newsletter uh, segment every week on Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic. If you're interested in that, you can uh, go to thecreateseries.com, get on that mailing list. You can listen to the podcast. You can join one of my classes. You know, I just I get around. I see. Natalie Roy, you've been a blessing. I think um, people are going to get a lot of value from this. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. So good to talk to you. Talking. Okay.